Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Gracious morning to you. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, because of this retreat. I were praying all that you purposed in organizing, giving us the privilege to have this retreat. You'll fulfill in every life in Jesus' name. Once again, Lord, open your word to everyone. And we pray your word will be of tremendous benefit to every heart, every soul, everyone present, both here and everywhere in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. A good amen before you sit down. God bless you. You can sit down. During this period, the whole world is remembering the crucifixion of Christ, the death of Christ, the burial, the resurrection, and then he'll be coming back again. And now we need to center our mind, our heart, our thoughts to the word he gives us. This is the most important thing in the scriptures. Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the purpose and the plan of redemption because of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Yesterday we dealt with crucified by Christ. Today, we're coming to dead and buried with Christ. He died. He died for us. We die with him. He was buried on our behalf. And he took all our sins. He took all our degradation. Every evil thing buried with him. And now we, as we believe in the Lord and come to him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind were now dead and buried with Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 3. Know ye not, don't you know, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Look at verse 4. It says, therefore, we are buried with him dead with him and buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life verse 5 it says for if we have been planted together that's burial in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that the body of sin might die, that henceforth we should not serve sin, and then in verse 7, it says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's not talking about Christ, because Christ never sinned. And there was no time when Christ was bound by sin. But we, human beings, that now as we identify with Christ, for he that is dead is freed from from sin and then he tells us in verse 8 now if we be dead we Christ you see that we expected in experience that we be dead with Christ now if we be dead with Christ we believe that we shall also live within verse 9 says knowing that Christ 
being raised from the dead there is no more death has no more dominion over him verse 10 it says for in that he died he died unto sin once but in that he liveth he liveth unto god 11 it says likewise because of what christ has done in view of what christ has done by the power of what christ has done likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto god through jesus christ our lord verse 12 tells us let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey each in the lusts thereof. That summarizes our part. As we identify with Christ and we're dead with him. Three points we're looking at. Number one, the vicarious needful death for the populated universe. The whole of the universe everywhere. Anywhere there is a human being counted as part of the population of the whole universe, Christ's death was needful. Vicarious death, needful for you, for me, for everyone. Number two, the virtuous necess necessary deadness for purposeful uniqueness for you to become unique, identified. As lifted up and coming side by side with Christ for the purpose of the death of Christ you need to have this virtuous necessary deadness number three and the valuable notable deaths for profitable usefulness if we're going to be useful useful to ourselves Useful in the community, useful in the kingdom of God, useful in the sight of the Lord. We have to have this valuable, notable death so that our lives will not be lived for self. It will be lived for everybody else and then our lives will bear fruit. Your life will bear fruit. Number one, the vicarious, needful death for the populated universe. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then in verse 4, it tells us, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. have you noticed his death according to the scriptures his burial according to the scriptures his resurrection according to the scriptures as we look at this the three things number one is pre-planned death before our detached time before the world began that death was already ordained of the lord pre-planned death before our dated time number two the propitiatory death in due time when the time came for fulfillment for performance christ came and he died for you died for me died for everyone number three is purposeful death for all till the end of time till the end of time we're looking at number one there is pre-planned death before our dated time look at first peter chapter one verse 19 and notice it says but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Look at verse 20 there. In verse 20, who verily was foreordained 
before the foundation of the world for ordained pre-planned known unto god planned by god before the foundation of the world but was manifested in these last times for you second timothy chapter one reading from verse nine it says who has saved us and called us with an holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in christ jesus look at this look at that before the world began the plan of salvation the plan of redemption the pre-planned death of christ before our dated time before the world began it says in titus chapter 1 verse 2 it says in hope of eternal life which god that cannot lie promised before the world began and the only way he could make that promise he knew he knew ahead of time because the bible says known unto god are all his works from the beginning and even from the before the world the, the plan of salvation that man will fall God knew that Adam and Eve will succumb to temptation. God knew and he planned before the world began that will return to him and will have everlasting life. Revelation chapter 13, look at verse 8, the very last line there. It says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so the salvation of man is not an afterthought the lord knew it much much before the beginning of the world let's look at number two now number two is propitiatory death in due time in due time god walks by his own timetable and when the time came for Christ to come, in due time it was done. Romans chapter 5 verse 6. It says, for when we were yet without strength. Look at this. In due time. At the appropriate time. At the appointed time. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly the ungodly they're all the whole of the world had been sinful all have sinned and come short of the glory of god and we were all ungodly and then at the right time at the proper time at the appointed time at the ordained time in due time christ died for the ungodly look at verse 8 in verse 8 for god commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners he knew we couldn't be any other sin but sinners we couldn't uh, polish ourselves recreate ourselves renew ourselves and save ourselves we were sinners and it's at that time while we were yet sinners christ died for us then in verse 9, verse 9 says much more then. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10 uh, says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life in verse 11 it says and not only so but we also joy in god through our lord jesus christ by whom we have now received now receive he did it at that time now the moment we repent and the moment we turn to the lord and believe now we receive the atonement romans chapter 3 reading from verse 23 it tells us for all have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, it says, but being justified freely, freely, we don't pay anything, neither with our tears, nor with our work, nor with money, nor with property. We don't pay, pay for salvation, being justified, saved freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. It's done it. All we need for salvation, it's done. For forgiveness, it's done. For freedom, it's done. For a ticket to heaven, it's done. And it's said to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. The remission of sin, the forgiveness of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And then he tells us in First John chapter 2, verse 1. First John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. There are people who plan their lives on the basis of sinning. There are people who think they understand grace on the basis of sinning. They say, grace, grace, God's grace, abundant grace, a marvelous grace. And when they talk like that, when they think like that, they're thinking sin will always be there and then grace will come. Grace will come. Grace will come. The more I sin, the more they sin, the more the grace of God will be manifested. That's erroneous. That's misinterpretation, misplacement of, of grace. You see, he doesn't want us to sin. He says, my little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. But if, have you noticed that? If, not when, as if it will happen to everybody and when it happens this is what you do it says it shouldn't happen but if if it happens accidentally if carelessly if and because you are not watching in if normally it should not happen you are saved from sin you are not saved into sin we're saved from sin that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, is what we call an emergency door in the house. If something should happen that you don't take the normal route, and the only thing available is the emergency door. Very quickly, go through that emergency door. We don't use that emergency door as the normal thing for every day. Fire outbreak, emergency door. Something beyond your control, emergency door. Accident, emergency door. The emergency door is if any man seen, we have an advocate of the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Look at verse 2 there. Verse 2, he is the propitiation. He is the one that comes to cleanse and cover and takes every sin away. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Chapter 4, verse 9. First John chapter 4, reading from verse 9, it says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his Son, his only begotten Son, into the world that we might live through him. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, hearing, is, the, is love not that we loved God we didn't initiate salvation 
We didn't uh, come up with the plan of salvation. He first did it, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation, the means of cleansing, removal, forgiveness, freedom, justification, to be the propitiation for our sins. Look at number three here. Number three, his purposeful death for all till the end of time purposeful death for everyone for you for me for all until the end of time first john chapter 3 verse 18 in first john chapter 3 verse 18 here is what he tells us there first john chapter 3 Verse 18, my little children, let not let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Then in first Peter chapter 3, verse 18. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also at once suffered for sin not for his own sin the just for the unjust the perfect for the imperfect the sinless for the sinful and the spotless for the people having spots and wrinkles the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god that's the purpose the purpose of his death from that time he died until the end of time that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit in Titus chapter 2 verse 14 Titus chapter 2 verse 14 the purpose of his death until the end of time who gave himself for us that he might redeem us that the purpose he gave himself he died on the cross he was buried he rose again why that he might redeem us what does that mean purchase us that he might take us out of where we were to where he is that he might redeem us from all iniquity there are people who minimize the power of the blood of christ and they gauge that the power in the blood of christ can save them redeem them from this little hateful sin and from this sin that brings untold suffering to them but other sins that bring them pleasure other sins that bring them money other sins that bring them landed property other sins that everybody has to commit according to them to be able to make it in their country they say that one God cannot save them from death. Look at this. Who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. There are iniquities peculiar to every community in every country on earth. And if you are part of that community, it's expected they say that's the normal act the normal action the normal behavior the normal habit of that community and sometimes it is not a local geographical community it is a professional community they say once you are in this particular profession there is an iniquity there is, there is a kind of sin transgression that is associated with that kind of 
community it will be for them if they don't know christ but there are people who say they are christians and they say there are some iniquities that are associated with a group of people can you be a bachelor and not have this particular iniquity associated with those who are bachelors can you be a spinster a single lady and not they, they, they say there's a sin associated with a single lady any single lady anywhere and so there are people who believe that no matter how much they pray how much they read the bible how many retreats they go to this particular iniquity is associated with being a single lady but you know what the bible says that once you're born again whatever community whatever profession whatever male or female group you belong to and whatever a society like a gang in quotes whatever you belong to you know that whatever iniquity is associated with other people he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity i even learned that those who are in the preaching profession like pastors and ministers preachers they say there is something if your church is going to grow if you're going to be an interesting preacher you must tell some stories that you know are not true and you must wrap them up in deception and lying so that they say that's, that's the iniquity associated with the profession of preaching and you are doing it you are, you are not doing anything bad they say they say you are telling that lie and you are making that deception so that your profession as a preacher your church will grow but you know God does not recognize that and Christ does not recognize me telling a lie for him on his behalf that people may come into the kingdom who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works now that's what peculiar that's what the people say is a weird man it's an odd man out it doesn't fit into society it doesn't fit into the mold of everybody and then they'll say he looks peculiar he talks peculiar he thinks peculiar he dresses peculiar he does everything peculiar is a class by himself and that's all he is is so heavenly minded is no earthly good is peculiar can i tell you something christ died that you will look peculiar to the people of the world they will know it's not our kind it's not in a society and he doesn't agree with us he lives a life pure and holy and peculiar who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works i'm going to ask you some questions now in your community how peculiar are you in your natural family extended family how peculiar are you in the village meeting in a township meeting with your people when they all gather together from america from europe from asia from everywhere and from anywhere they are from nigeria here and you are having a meeting if they are all not born again and you say you are born again and you have come to christ how are your thoughts your thoughts your outlook your own decision how peculiar are you 
in a professional gathering this is your profession and they are talking of something now apart from the equations and apart from all the things they have to do professionally it comes to morals it comes to parties it comes to other ideas how peculiar are you or do you just melt in you are part of them or do you just uh, key in uh, into what they are doing you have lost the purpose the purpose of Christ's death for us the purpose is that he Christ the Redeemer the Savior our substitute the sacrifice that he might redeem us from all iniquity and then to purify unto himself unto himself unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works number two now point number two we're looking at the virtuous necessary deadness for purposeful uniqueness we're looking at romans chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 7 he that is dead is freed from sin he that is dead is freed from sin he's talking spiritual you're still alive but you are dead with christ but let's talk natural dead he that is dead in the physical now is dead is free from alcohol is freed from smoking dead is freed from marijuana dead is free from violence dead is free from pride dead is free from retaliation look at the man the man is dead and now they carry the body dead and they are taking uh, the they, they are taking the dead body to the morgue and then they put him there and then they said we need a space here they say you pay this amount and all they are negotiating the man is dead he cannot take part in that in the physical he that is dead is freed from old boyfriend old girlfriend old habit old anger old violence old disposition the man is dead the man is free now spiritual what the lord is saying is if we're dead what christ the things that attracted us before and the things that drew us before and the things that impacted us before and the things that got us roused before if we're dead spiritually all those things do not matter anymore read it now for he that is dead is free from sin look at verse 11 in verse 11 it says likewise in the same way reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed dead indeed there are times you think somebody is dead and then as they slap him to test he said why are you slapping me and they said the man is not dead indeed when he's dead indeed he's dead to all the things around him he's dead to all the things you might throw at him he says then likewise reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto god through jesus christ our lord at any end verse 12 let not sin reign therefore in your mortal body that you should be it and the loss thereof three things number one purposefully dead with the substitute number two perseveringly dead to all sins number three permanently dead to sell number one purposefully dead or the substitute look at verse 8 there Romans 6 verse 8 now 
if we be dead with Christ, our substitute. If we be dead with Christ, our Savior. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. We don't just remain dead. That means now inactive, not doing anything, not walking anywhere. We're dead on the one hand, and then the resurrection life comes upon us, and we live with him Colossians chapter 3 verse 3 he says for ye are dead he said if you are born again if you are a child of God if you have come into Christ here is what we can say categorically about you ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, there, when Christ, who is our life, we're dead on the one hand, and then Christ becomes our life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 11. In Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 11, this is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, you see that it's all over in the epistles. It says it's a faithful saying. If we truly are identified with Christ, and we'll be dead with him. We shall also live with him. There are two parts to that sentence. One part, dead with him. Second part, live with him. Here and hereafter. And the first part will take place first. If we we'll be dead with him. Only on that ground only on that basis will the second part take place we shall also live with him if we're not dead with him whatever religion we claim whatever church we identify with if we're not dead with him whatever activity we're involved in in the church or outside the church if we're not dead with him, whatever good we do, we miss that first part. And the second part will never take place. It's only if we be dead with him, dead to sin, dead to sell, dead to all the suggestions of Satan. If we be dead with him, only then in this life and in the world to come, shall we also live with him. Look at verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. He's still talking about being dead by Christ. If we suffer somebody insults you that's suffering and the normal thing if you're still alive in the flesh you insult me you slander me you throw that at me then you pick up your own slander and you throw at him you did that to me privately I'll show you. Then you go to the social media and you broadcast your own slander all over the world because you are not dead you cannot suffer wow. as somebody who is dead dead to slander dead to insult dead to abuse so you are reactionary you react and react and react if anybody tries to persecute you and you say me you persecute uh-huh i know the bible but you know lay the bible aside now blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake uh-uh i can't apply that now because i'm going to show this man this woman who i am 
you cannot suffer with him because you are not dead when you are dead you are dead to insult you are dead to slander you are dead to abuse you are dead to violence you are dead to whatever anybody may do if we suffer we shall also reign with him to pass to the sentence one part if we suffer the persecution the indignation of the people if we suffer anything that the people that they do those in-laws they call you names and they say this and that they are angry at you you're taking our son away from us and we're against you and then you come to retaliate at home because of what the in-laws are doing against you how so how are you suffering patiently are you suffering persistently how are you suffering perseveringly if we suffer we shall also reign with him if we deny him at the time of suffering at the time of persecution at the time of trial at the time of looking for money at the time of searching for this and that at the time of wanting to be like the world if we deny him he also will deny us we're looking at galatians chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 19 for i through the law am dead to the Lord that I might live unto God dead to the Lord that I might live unto God unto whatever God declares and decides and demands of me I now live unto God look at verse 20 it says I am crucified with Christ no wonder it sang in the midnight in the prison no wonder after they had beaten him and it appeared that he's dead he rose up again and went back to iconium to that same place he said i'm here again i show up again because no matter what happens i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me liveth in the morning afternoon evening liveth at the crossroad in the farm at the riverside when you're fishing he liveth at the time when you are with strangers and when you are with familiar people christ liveth in me that's christianity but those who turn their christianities off on when you want to do the usual habitual bad evil sinful retaliatory thing they switch off their christianity they say now nah, must show the man show that woman now we must show them those of his people oh they think because i'm deep alive that's it. they can do that to me i switch up deeper life and then and now my normal sinful self as if they have never met christ but you know when you come to christ you don't switch on and switch off switch on and switch off i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the face of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me amen for everyone there amen. number two here number two perseveringly dead to all sins perseveringly dead to all sins first peter chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 24 first peter chapter 2 verse 24 who his own self bear our sins carried our sins removed our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins 
we believers we children of god we the so are saved we the so have tasted of the good life to come that we being dead to cease you know if we are children of god not children of god we're in different categories we're members children of god we're ministers children of god we're teachers children of god we're preachers children of god we're pastors children of god we're husbands children of god we're wives children of god children of god in every category and then we find ourselves in different places some of us were in Port Harcourt, some of us were in Lagos, some of us in London, some of us in Australia, some of us in America. Children of God, anywhere. It says, if we are children of God and we have tasted of the goodness of the Lord, whoever we are, wherever we are, and whatsoever we have become in profession, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness should live unto righteousness isn't that the reason what the Lord has given us salvation and persistently consistently perseveringly and every time every moment we're dead now those who are dead in their graves they're not there today and then they hear something is happening in the village that land that belongs to our great great grandfather that somebody is going to do something is coming to do something there they said what not on my dead body even though i'm dead and then the fellow gets up and he shows up and said you disturbed my resting i should have been in the grave now but you know i heard that this is happening and i come to fight it out when we're spiritually dead and we're dead with christ we're there persistently consistently dead to sin and we don't hear anything that rouses us up rouses up our anger our indignation and then we get up and it, it travel that we didn't even plan before we travel and some people have accidents on the way because of that they didn't plan to travel before but they had something is happening somebody is grabbing something they're grabbing something there and then hurriedly they get up and then they travel and they lose their lives and die in the stage of anger what are you going to tell God? But you know, as we come to know the Lord and we understand that every moment of our lives, whatever may be happening, whatever may not be happening, we know that we are dead to sin, that we should live in righteousness, our lives will be peaceful. Your own life, I said your own life, will be peaceful. Now, medical doctors will tell you that your long life and your healthy life depends on the state of your mind if your mind is jolted if your mind is pushed and dragged if your mind you get angry if your mind you're violent on the inside you're retaliating even though you have not even taken action you're a retaliatory fellow in your mind it will affect and impact your body your body will be getting weakened and weakened and weakened that's the reason why when you hear any bad news the bad news gets to your mind and your hands are weakened you cannot carry a bucket of water that's why if you are standing or walking and you had a very bad news the bad news gets to your mind and guess what your legs are weak you cannot stand and you cannot walk the mind affects affects your body that's what they call psychosomatic medicine that 
the condition of the mind affects the body and so if you are like that i'm born again i'm born again and then you're always jolted and you're angry and you move to that you move to that and you're living your life you're galloping here and there on the basis of anger on the basis of violence and religion and, and the revenge you may not live as long as you ought to live but with long life will the lord satisfy you long life long life yeah. holiness brings happiness happiness brings health and when you are settled in your life that you are dead unto sin indeed nobody will cut short your life yeah. i said nobody will cut short your life yeah. and then you say quietly the sun is shining you say thank you jesus for the sun the rain is coming thank you jesus for the rain there is food thank you jesus for the food anything and everything thank you jesus all the thank you jesus people they will live long yeah. and you are one of them yeah. i am one of them the Lord fulfill it in your life in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 1. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, am yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And then in verse 2, in verse 2, it tells us that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the loss of men, but to the will of God. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, For the time past of our lives may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness and laws and excess of wine and rebellions and banquetings and abominable idolatries. The past, that's enough. Now today, a new life. A new life. A new direction in every life in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three, permanently dead to self permanently dead to self we're looking at second corinthians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 14 second corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 it tells us for the love of christ constraineth us anyway we go now the love of christ constraineth us love the love of christ is not only at the retreat the love of christ is not only at the worship center when we're worshiping the love of christ is not only in our christian home during a family devotion the love of christ is not there only when we're studying the bible and reading the bible the love of christ permeates our lives and constrains us controls us directs us every time as we're going to talk hold on let the love of christ stay in its right place every time an enemy has done something and you want to have the tendency of replying reacting hold on let the love of christ come to its rightful place anytime somebody does something I don't like that i don't appreciate that and it looks like they're going to they're trying to get at me and they're going to try to pull my leg okay i'll do it. hold on hold on let the love of christ stay in his rightful place and from the rightful place of the love of christ now you can talk now you can act now you can respond for the love of christ 
constraineth us. It will take some practice for some people because if you have been an impetuous person, if you have been a person that quickly jumps into action and now you are to slow down, it will take some practice. You have to tell yourself, now, nah, the love of Christ must constrain me this is what i should have done i would have done if it were yesterday if it were last week or last month but now i'm going to put in place the throne of the love of christ and that love of christ must now dictate what i do it says for the love of christ constraineth us because we're just judge that if one died for all then were all dead. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not live henceforth unto themselves. That's how the majority of people act. They live unto themselves. What I like what i want what i desire what i expect what i demand they make themselves the king of the universe and everything must revolve around them they are the axle by which the world rotates and if it's not done my way the way i like the way i want there will be no rest for anybody. That self, that self, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Look at First Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 19 first corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 what know ye not that your body is a temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of god and ye are not your own and ye are not your own and ye are not your own if you borrow dress i hear some people when they're going for wedding they're not satisfied with what they have they borrow dress they borrow car and they borrow what they are going to use to make the wedding you know, flamboyant of the world and then after the wedding they will return the dress and the car now if you borrow a car to use and you know it's not yours you know you use it carefully how the owner wants that car to be used and the body <clears throat> is not ours for ye are not your own if your body is not your own you must use it in line with the expectation of the one that owes that body here is your hand the owner that's christ you are bought with a price how does he want you to use this hand slap people destroy things set people on fire and set uh, properties on fire that's not the goal that's not the purpose of the one who owns that hand you are not the owner you see it as the owner demands your eyes not your own your mouth not your own as he giving you the mouth to slander to abuse to insult to criticize to curse no use that mouth as the owner demands and then your feet walking places what does he want you to walk to how does he want you to use the feet that actually belong to him? It says, "Ye yeah, are not your own. You cannot, you cannot use it just like that. Can you see now the temple 
the church building belonging to a particular church or denomination and you are passing that way and as you pass you say why is this uh, building like that all the time and then i don't like the way that wall is and then you go and buy paint even though it costs you money and then you say you want to you know paint their temple for them without them asking you they come and they say what are you doing there well i don't like the color of this is it yours why did you come to bother us here they won't appreciate you because you come to paint like that now your body belongs to god and it's the temple of god you don't own that body uh-huh i want to bleach it i want to paint it I want to use whatever kind of soap so I can change the color. It's not your own. We do things thoughtlessly that even though we read the Bible and we say that this is a Bible-believing church, we set the Bible aside in all our actions. It says, look at that watch. No, ye not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Then it says, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it tells us, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, here is your whole duty. Here is your lifetime duty. Therefore, glorify God in your body let me ask you how apart from retreat time when you have to you know do this for us at the retreat do that for us at the retreat do that for us at a special location but you know all those special locations they're just for a brief time Thursday to Sunday that's about five days and then after the five days what happens 365 days in the normal year 366 in the leap year all the rest of the days what do you do you glorify god in your body every moment whatever you are going to do and you don't take loss into your hand and in your spirit which are god's you make sure that now you have the consciousness i belong to god everywhere i go in everything i do in everything i say i belong to god body soul and spirit and my goal is to glorify him all the time you will i will Romans chapter 14 verse 7 in Romans chapter 14 verse 7 for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself of God all the time living for God speaking for God acting for God doing everything for God for God's glory all the time point number 3 now in point number three, the valuable, notable debt for profitable usefulness. John chapter 12, reading from verse 24. For verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit verse 25 it says he that loveth his life shall lose it he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal verse 26 if any man sub me let him follow me and where i am there shall also my servant be if any man serve me 
him will my father honor. Three things. Number one, supernatural harvest after death of planted seed. Number two, sanctified hearts always dead to the permissive, pessimistic society. Number three, sublime heaven after dedication to peerless service. Number one, supernatural harvest after death of planted seeds. John chapter 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone. He's talking about us, but he's using the illustration of a seed that falls into the ground, planted in the ground. And then there's cultivation. And that seed dies, then there is it germinates and then comes up, brings forth much fruit. If you hold on to that seed, you put it in a glass jar and you're always looking at it. You appreciate it. You don't allow it to come out of that jar and fall into the ground. It will be alone, alone, alone and lonely. But if you do what the Creator has decided must be done, that there will be planting season and reaping season, and you allow it to fall to the ground to die, then it will bring forth much fruit. Supernatural harvest. In your life, supernatural harvest. But if you say, my body, my body, the way it is, I want it like that. They asked a particular lady, chummy, chic, beautiful, smart, plump. They asked her, why is it you are not married? Said, well, I don't like to tell anybody this, but you know what? The way my body is, I want it like that. Once I submit my body, I get pregnant, then I give child, I get pregnant, I give a child, I get pregnant, I give a child, my body will change. And the look of it will not be as chic, as beautiful as it is. So she will stay alone and be alone all the rest of her. And when she comes to old age, that somebody should come and take care of her. Nobody, because she wants to keep her body just like that. It's the same thing. Anything in our lives that we have, a good thing, a, you know, a wonderful thing, a good gift. If you, why are you not in the choir? You know, I want to keep my dignity and respect. You know, I don't want to be on the you know, choir master said, go here, go there, don't sing that, don't sing like that at my age now for somebody, they call choir master to be pushing me here and there, I want to preserve my dignity, you know, you'll never amount to anything, why are you not an usher, an usher, you know, I stand there and all the time until they come to replace me, how can I do that, I want to keep my dignity and my ability and my everything I have, you you know, the place I walk, I'm a director, I'm a manager there, and I control people. And for me now to come to church and have people, I should be controlling my place or to come and tell me, it's your turn, go and stand there, go and stay there. I cannot. You know, you will just die alone without any usefulness. But... If you forget yourself, if you forget your dignity, if you forget that you'll soil your hand, if you forget that somebody will say, go there, go there, and you die to self, you'll bear fruit. I said you'll bear fruit. I'm looking for those who are going to bear fruit. Bear fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit. You will bear fruit in Jesus' name.
except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abideth alone but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit i'm happy about something i won't tell you i said i'm happy about something you want to hear i'm happy about you that things are going to change that all this you know i keep myself i protect myself i preserve myself thank god thank god thank god and even when the retreat finishes and i go back to where i came from i'll keep on thanking god for you that now that corn of wheat will fall into the ground and die and when i come back again because i cannot stay away without coming back to see you when i come back again i will hear you are bearing fruit you are bearing fruit you are bearing fruit praise the lord i'm talking to fruit bearing people even though you have been bearing fruit before you'll bear more fruit in jesus name we're looking at number two here number two is sanctified hearts always dead to the pessimistic world you know the world they're always pessimistic they say cannot 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 be a fruit you cannot be happy you cannot be holy you cannot be healthy you are not they're pessimistic but now you are optimistic look at verse 24 again very late very late i say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abides alone but if it die it bringeth forth tell me tell me tell me much fruit that's your life look at verse 25 he that loveth his life shall lose it he that loveth his life shall tell me you know let me give an illustration of myself sometimes when coming to preach in the morning the body is saying are you going to go there again the voice is saying are you going to exert that voice again and the legs are saying are you going to be walking up and down again and then the hands are saying are you going to be pointing like that like that again you know if i listen to that hand to those legs and to the heart and the physical heart i'll say okay i better sit down but you know the more you sit down it's like when you hang your hand your right hand with a bandage for one week for one month for three months and you're hanging the hand like that by the time you remove that bandage you cannot stretch the hand it's like when you bandage your leg with bandage or even with pop one month, two months, three months. By the time they remove the POP, that leg is thinner than the other. Because what you don't use, you will lose. You understand? What you don't use, you will lose. How many of us went to secondary school and then we studied math, chemistry, physics, biology, and civic and geography, history, all those things, and then we finished school. After finishing school, we have a good grade. And then one week, one month, you don't read anything. And two months, three months, you don't read anything. By the time it's one year, you have forgotten everything that you learned before. What you don't use, you lose. If you don't use that thing you have, he that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. You're using it, it will increase. You're using it, it will be more empowered. You're using it, and then you are growing higher and higher, stronger and stronger in your life in Jesus name you will use what you have 
to the glory of God, you'll use what you have. And as you use and use and use, you're becoming greater, brighter, higher, and uh, more uh, more useful in your life in Jesus name I'm looking at number 3 here now number 3 sublime heaven after dedication to peerless service look at verse 26 we're looking at John chapter 12 verse 26 if any man serve me not serving himself if any man sub me not serving satan if any man sub me not serving sin if any man sub me let him follow me and where i am there shall also my servant be can you picture yourself at the end of time the gate to heaven opens and the angels are standing in attention and you find yourself coming and you are walking majestically and all eyes in heaven looking at you and then as you enter they usher you to the throne of God and the almighty God says welcome you endured to the very end enter into the joy of the Lord I'm looking at you how happy you will be on that day and then the Lord conducts you to your mansion and he said that is your mansion what joy it will be for you and what glory it will be for you and the way to make that happen stop serving sin stop serving self stop serving Satan and now come and serve the Savior with all your life and with all your love if any man serve me let him follow me and where I am there shall also my servant be if any man serve me him will my father honor the father will honor you yeah. heaven will honor you yeah. and even children of god here on earth will, will honor you in jesus name yeah. with honor he'll satisfy you and with long life he'll beautify your life yeah. are you there yeah. what are you now why don't you stand up and say, Lord, I thank you. Dead to self, dead to sin, dead to society, and alive unto God and serving God. And your life will be productive. Your life will be beautiful. Your life will be honored by heaven and earth. Open your mouth. Talk to the Lord in prayer.